All right, hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, while we are not uh, Eclipse, or while we're not Linux, uh, just like Chris, I'm part of the, the Eclipse Foundation, actually. Uh, but what we do heavily complements the, the Linux ecosystem, and uh, we're looking forward to working with you. So what I'm, uh, I'm going to do, just a quick overview, I'm going to give a little bit about us, since we're not, uh, we're not as well known as some of the bigger companies out there yet. Uh, I'll define an AI ecosystem, and you'll see a lot of relevant themes today. Uh, that are very similar to other presentations in this uh, within the, the speeches today. I'll talk a bit about open source frameworks. Uh, so like TensorFlow, PyTorch, for those of you who are familiar with it. If not, I'll, I'll give a high level overview of those. Uh, different file formats. So some of the, some, so kind of like, uh, again, how Chris mentioned earlier, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot, I think a lot of uh, foundations work together on different, different things. Uh, so there's there's file formats at, and specs at the at all the different foundations that all kind of work to work together and interop. Uh, I'll talk about open accelerators. So one thing kind of missing from the ecosystem today is um, Kubernetes actually doesn't work with FPGAs or custom accelerators very well, uh, and it's still a very ill-defined area. Uh, so schedulers today are not uh, very open to edge. There's a lot of work to do, uh, as kind of illustrated in the previous blueprints. So a lot of that's still kind of in progress. Um, so I'm hoping to maybe present some newer ideas here today. And then finally, uh, another, another area that's not well defined yet, and, and I think will be relevant to LFAI people, is open standards for AI metrics. And so to start, uh, so Conduit, uh, you know, we develop, uh, we're a heavy developer of open source software. Uh, so uh, my open source life mainly comes from Eclipse Deep Learning for J. Uh, but we also heavily develop uh, standards. We work with other open source communities. I'm also on the chair of Keras. So I'm a, I'm a Keras chair as well as uh, we work heavily with the TensorFlow community in TensorFlow Java. Uh, so that's not a well-known fact, but uh, we're, we're actually, we actually have a pretty decent open source footprint. I'm also the author, I'm also an O'Reilly author uh, for deep learning and we have a few when we're distributed all around the globe uh, with our team predominantly in Asia. And so to start, the definition of an open source AI ecosystem. So basically, to start, the components necessary to build, evaluate, and execute AI algorithms. So AI algorithms, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, are primarily based on this idea of operations. So operations can be something complex, like uh, something in signal processing, or it can just be two plus two, subtraction, multiplication. Uh, you know, there are different uh, hardware, different hardware implement all these operations. And, some, and there, there are different uh, hardware SDKs from say, I'll just mention ARM since they're here today. Uh, they have ARM NN. Uh, you know, there's other vendors like that implement MKLDNN, QDNN. And basically, the turns out the, the chip vendors are better than us at writing math for their own chip. And writing, writing math code is a specialized area that only people who generally work in physics or something like that and heavily in, or work heavily in C and C++ typically do. Uh, these are not things that normal software developers will typically touch. Uh, you know, there are frameworks for these things, which I'll cover as well. Uh, so, you know, that's your TensorFlow, your PyTorch, you know, kind of these, these Python level interfaces to these, to these low level math routines. Uh, the file formats, you know, so there's, you know, we, we think of protocols, uh, but, you know, we need, we need to store our data somehow. Uh, so there, there's, there's, there's file formats out there, uh, again, at different open source foundations. You know, you have protobuf, you have Air, uh, Apache Arrow, you have uh, you have things built on, you have protocols built on top of those things like gRPC. Uh, so, you know, we use these file formats for storing data, for storing and for storing models. Uh, the, later today, uh, Onyx will be mentioned as well. Uh, it's actually a protobuf based it's actually a protobuf based format, and it's a it's a spec implemented as protobuf. Uh, so you need to know there's also HDF5 for Keras as well. Uh, so again, I'll get into all these in a, in a little bit. Uh, open accelerators. So one thing that's really hard to do is actually do cross-platform math. That's not, uh, you know, each, each chip vendor has their own way, you know, their, their own different kind of uh, nuances for implementing things the way they do. So different, different chips or different use cases. Uh, ARM-based ARM architecture is predominantly for, you know, kind of the edge-based edge computing. Uh, you typically have NVIDIA and, and more, more narrow applications like TPUs uh, by Google, among others. Uh, and, you, and you have other HPC vendors, like especially in Japan, uh, working on their own 
kind of specialized uh, AI accelerators for, you know, and they're, they're, they're all better at different things. Like, so if you do CNNs, uh, turns out you're better at computer vision, but other chips might be better at NLP. Uh, so it's not, uh, so there's reason, there's performance reasons and use case reasons why different chips only implement various operations or only implement uh, optimized versions of certain routines. So being able to have a cross-platform SDK for that would be interesting. So something that can work with all these different things you don't have to, that's kind of what the deep learning frameworks take care of, but even then they only do half the job. So it's still, so community efforts like the, the open blueprints that were discussed in the prior presentation are crucial to actually bridging a lot of things from research to uh, production. And finally, again, metrics. You know, so, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, I know the, the general public talks a lot about uh, bias in AI. You know, so racist models is, is something that comes up a lot and also accuracy. You know, eventually once AI is actually deployed everywhere, uh, then how, how do we know what accuracy is? You know, so you have, uh, you have a lot of programs out there, you know, LFAI being one of them that's trying to build out these standards. Uh, but there's, you know, there's also the, there's also the AI, the AI partnership by Google and Microsoft and OpenAI as well. Uh, so there's, there's several different uh, standards bodies kind of working on these things. And it's still, it's still very early yet though. So what is, you know, what is the notion of accuracy for different use cases? Uh, you know, how do we know, how do we know what a, a general, you know, generalized model actually looks like? How do we know something's robust? Uh, so, for example, uh, one, one area, recommender engines. Recommender engines are inherently based on user preferences. So how do you know what you consider accurate for a given user base? Netflix will be different from Amazon. You know, so for example, we have recommender engines out there, and as users, we, 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 we all know that uh, we get recommended, the second you buy a vacuum cleaner, every site will recommend you vacuum cleaners. And they just, they'll, they'll say, buy five more. Uh, so, you know, as users, we know that the, there's work to do in terms of, you know, recommender, recommender engines with, you know, with e-commerce, right? So, how do we know what we as users consider to be accurate? It, it's hard to define, right? So, these, these things are, it's still an open-ended research problem for many different kinds of AI problems, whether it's something, you know, something like recommender engines or all the way to self-driving cars. And so, to start, uh, so this is this is an example of kind of the whole supply chain, you know. So so starting from starting from the top, you have distributed runtimes, you know. So Nvidia, for example, they have they have their own they have they have they have their own MPI based clustering stuff. You have by the Apache Foundation, you have Apache Spark, which is typically used for uh, di different different kinds of distributed SQL queries and, and ETL. And then uh, something something that's not as well known uh, but heavily used in finance actually. Uh, Real-time trading is uh, Apache Aeron, or Aeron, which is used in a lot of, uh, it's, it's by some consultants out of London, heavily used in, in the ACA framework and a, in a few other uh, areas, and we use it as our primary uh, communication layer for our distributed Spark training and deep learning for j uh, So our framework, uh, obviously, is, is one implementation of this. Uh, so we focus on providing, uh, you, know, we, you know, we started as kind of this Java thing, and we kind of, and, and that's that's the main that's the main thing we dominate today. Uh, but again, we also work heavily. We also have a, a very compact uh, C++ layer uh, that interrupts with every deep learning framework out there, so we can read and write uh, TensorFlow, Keras, and soon to be Onyx as well. Uh, and then again, as, as I mentioned, the file format. So from left to right, you have Onyx. Uh, so that's that's kind of trying to be a neutral standard for defining neural networks. Uh, Keras and TensorFlow. Uh, Keras, uh, even though people think it's a part of TensorFlow, it is, but it also has its own file format. Even though it's the same interface, it's, a, it's actually, there's actually a, a higher level file format and a lower level one. People don't even know, people don't even know that. So in, order, it, you, so in order to fully use the TensorFlow ecosystem, you actually need two different file formats. A lot of people don't know that, right? Like, so it's just, it's just, it's just low level things like this that uh, only hits you after you want to deploy your model. So another, another thing people don't know, for example, is that TF Lite and TensorFlow are actually fairly different. It's a completely different runtime and everything. And so the, the general purpose one and the, the mobile only one uh, that, that Arm partner with Google on are actually very different. Uh, so, you know, so AI itself seems like it's, it's well-defined, but it's actually not, and there's actually a lot of fragmentation still. Um, there's also efforts in the compiler and IR space so there's there's one there's one there's one initiative at the Apache Foundation called TVM. Uh, so it's it's basically an I, an intermediary representation uh, 
which is uh, basically a way, it's, it's basically right before you get to assembly, it's a way for compilers to emit something that, that, that's platform neutral, and then you, you basically it's directly mappable to assembly on a particular system. Uh, there's also uh, LLVM has something called from Google called M MLIR that's being contributed to the LLVM Foundation. Uh, that's meant to be a kind of a, a, a basically a way for LLVM to implement uh, machine learning code now. Uh, so and then this will allow you to target different accelerators. Both TVM and MLIR uh, are both are, are both kind of competing standards in that space. I don't know which one will win. I don't know if there's going to be a Kubernetes or if there's going to be multiple. Uh, for hardware, uh, you know, there, there's 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 lower level vendors such as CameraCon, Intel, and then the more mainstream ones, ARM, Nvidia, um, the TPU, IBM Power, NEC, uh, and then I know Fujitsu just has their deep learning chip as well. So you know the the you know the you know East Asia I, I think is some of them are ARM based, some of them are ARM based, but some of them are just their own custom instruction sets. Uh, the, you know, all these firms are implementing specialized AI accelerators, some targeting computer vision, others targeting, you know, just time series use cases. Uh, but there, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to think about this. And finally, packaging. So packaging is generally language specific. Um, so, you know, we have our own, you know, so as I mentioned, uh, Google uses us for, for TensorFlow Java. Uh, so uh, we're, the, we're the main way of packaging uh, any, C code you, any C code you think of as only having a Python wrapper. We provide a Java, we provide an automatically generated equivalent with a built-in garbage collection and, and a bunch of other things. So we're, we're a way of packaging, it, it's, a, it's our format that's also open source. Uh, it's been used since 2012 uh, for, uh, for packaging Java projects. But you know, depending on whether you go to Python, you know you have, uh, you have, you have, Python, you have Python archives, you have Go, which is, you know, provides you a fat binary. There's all sorts of ways you can package things and generally it's language specific. So again, this is just kind of our overview. Uh, if you have questions about other other standards in this space, uh, I probably know I probably know about it, but maybe just didn't include it here. Uh, but I just want to give you because I'm mainly for brevity. But if you have because I know like the I know sometimes architecture diagrams get overwhelming. Uh, so if there's anything in particular you want me to zoom in on, just uh, let me know later. So uh, starting with open source frameworks. Uh, so. You know, right now we're we're kind of we just had an unfortunate uh, kind of consolidation in the space. Uh, the PFN folks uh, moved to moved from Chainer to PyTorch, so now we're down to almost uh, kind of a, a, a duopoly in the the, the framework space. Uh, you know, with us kind of being uh, more of a backend framework. You know, so you kind of have two ways to, to build to build frameworks uh, to build neural networks now, PyTorch and TensorFlow. So, but what what most what most I think end users don't know is that actually, those are actually C-based code bases. So PyTorch uh, is actually just a Python interface for the old uh, Lua, Lua based, uh, the, the, the Lua wrapped C code base from Torch. Uh, the same is true for TensorFlow. It's actually mainly a C++ library uh, that, has, uh, that, that has a lot of logic in Python, but all the core execution happens in uh, C++. Uh, you have, and then you have, you have language specific, you have, you have server middleware, which is, Anything where you'd write a web server or things, or you know, a system language like Go, like Kubernetes, for example, Kubernetes is written in Go. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, middleware, Java, Go, and C Sharp, kind of in the enterprise space. Uh, so generally, generally these generally these frameworks will have SDKs uh, for using models from those languages. Uh, we provide one, like I said, we we provide one for TensorFlow, for example, in Java. And then finally, you have the you know where where actually most of our developers. Even though we look like we look like we're Java, we're actually like again most of our developers are actually C and C++ people. So uh, framework development is specialized, uh, costly, and generally uh, requires a, a breadth of expert a breadth of expertise to, expertise to get right and and, uh, and to implement right to bridge to middleware. You know, in this case, to, to things like schedulers, you know, like Spark and all that. Uh, it requires a very specific specific and specialized team across multiple disciplines to to work well. Uh, so, uh, sorry, just backing up a little bit, ETL frameworks. Uh, so I mentioned Apache Spark is one. There's also more, tr more traditional ones for columnar data like Pandas and Dask. So, you know, so there, there's lots of ways to run what I'll just call distributed jobs, like run, an S run a large SQL query on my, my S3 bucket. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can do that. Uh, th those are some of the popular ones in Python. And schedulers, uh, so Kubernetes is, is obviously the Linux Foundation. Ray is fairly new. Uh, Ray is Ray started as mainly used for reinforcement learning. It's 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 built by the 
by what used to be Amplab, which created Spark. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Ray, it, it, it's, it's kind of up and coming. It's not at a foundation yet, uh, but the Linux Foundation might want to target this one. Uh, just throwing that out there. Um, but in general, I, I think it'll be, you know, it does have an open governance model, and I think they will be, I think they're, they're figuring out what to do with it. It's almost out of the lab now. Uh, Yarn, uh, so that's that's kind of the, Yarn and Mesa is kind of the old school Apache Foundation, you know, that's kind of the legacy Hadoop days. They're still around, even if they're, even if they're not growing, they're still around, they're still used. Sometimes you run, you know, sometimes you run these things on top of Kubernetes or you interrupt with it. Just depends on the use case, it depends on what's there. So machine learning frameworks, so not deep learning. Uh, you know, there, there, there is more than deep learning still, you know, just the more standard, more the, the more standard models that are actually still used by most of the industry, like random forest and things like that. So, you know, you've sklearn and xgboost. Deep learning frameworks, uh, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, Deep Learning for J, and then uh, serving middleware. So there, there's, there's, this is main, there's a lot of open source uh, serving middleware out there. Uh, so there's Celdon, there's TensorFlow, there's TensorFlow serving, and then uh, it's a kind of serving as well. So that there's a lot of open source kind of serving middleware out there. Um, you know, that there's different ways of implementing this. And it's basically taking your model and exposing it as a REST API or something over, over a network. Uh, that's still, it turns out, it, it's, you know, it turns out is a hard problem, especially if you're, say, deploying at the edge. Uh, so for example, serving middleware uh, doesn't run well on edge chips. And generally, uh, generally these things also don't, generally the, these things only bundle other libraries. And you don't generally have uh, integration with the serving middleware plus a custom accelerator. That's actually an edge case, yeah. But if you want AI to be deployed uh, for optimal speeds and, and minimal latency in production, uh, it turns out uh, that you have to do more than shrink the models. You actually have to integrate the high-level middleware that developers talk to. And so that's still kind of a that's still kind of an open-ended problem yet. That's actually a, the the main thing we work on is just that part. Okay, so here's an example of a lot of different file formats. So again, uh, there, there's a lot of different foundations uh, that, that, that where all this work kind of spans. You know, you have Apache Arrow. So again, this is a, this is an in-memory file format for just data interchange between, say, Python and Spark. Uh, so that's a, that, that was the use case this was developed with, but basically if you've ever heard of a data frame in R or, even if you just know an Excel spreadsheet is with, with columns, uh, with columns and then add types on top of that, you have Apache Arrow. It's an interchange format. Um, you have Arrow, Parquet. Again, uh, those, those were both heavily developed in the Hadoop ecosystem, Orc as well. Uh, so th these are all different ways of storing, of storing data. Uh, sometimes they're used as configuration file formats. Portabuff, Portabuff is an example of that. So Onyx is Portabuff based, uh, developed by Google. And then uh, JSON, I think we all know what JSON is. Uh, DL frameworks, uh, so it turns out, uh, you know, there's, there's actually a lot of different ways you can save models. So there's portabuff based, based file formats, there's HDF5, which is Keras, uh, and then you have uh, another one now is flat buffers, built by the guy who's, who, who did protocol buffers. Um, so there, there's N plus one file format standards, uh, each better than the last sometimes, uh, some used for legacy reasons. So Onyx, for example, picked uh, Protobuf just because it was widely adopted, not because it was the best one to use. Uh, and then you have other lower level, you have other lower level uh, communications on top of those file formats. So in this case, gRPC and Aaron, as I mentioned before. So accelerators. Uh, so you know you have basically. So you can imagine uh, application developers taking an open standard like Onyx and then wanting to run it on a target chip, and then that that chip uh, will have their own optimized math, uh, the way of running certain kinds of, of, you know, maybe convolutional neural networks for computer vision, RNNs for time series, you know, or, or whatever, whatever optimized libraries might be present on that, on that chip vendor's uh, chip. Uh, so what, what you might want to do is you might want to have uh, cross-platform middleware that knows the difference between what runs well on Intel and what runs well on ARM. So that way you as a developer can just output, say, an Onyx model and then, and then know you're going to get high performance on, on, on whatever chip. You know, one, one of the biggest, so the reason I bring this up is because one of the biggest problems that uh, most, I, I think most people aren't familiar with this today, and the Onyx people should talk about, is this idea of op coverage. So as I mentioned before, uh, certain, certain chips will only implement certain operations because they're targeted at certain use cases. So whenever, whenever you hear about TensorFlow, TensorFlow actually itself is a fragmented thing that runs differently on different chips. Most people don't know that. 
So for example, if you run on the TPU, they actually implement only a small subset of TensorFlow. TF Lite is a small subset of TensorFlow, which is for mobile, right? Like, so chips don't always implement uh, the latest architectures either. So for example, if you go, if you go to use CUDNN from NVIDIA, they don't generally have the latest CNN architectures either. Uh, so this is a fairly common problem in the space. The, so the, these highly optimized libraries are generally behind the cutting edge. So it's hard to build something general purpose, and it's not you know it's not their fault. You know you have you have you have you know you have a lot of time being being spent on these things, and so you need to pick carefully what what you put in your roadmap to optimize. So having something general purpose that that knows what to use where uh, can be really helpful. And so the, just this integrate this this idea of integrating these things is is actually still a hard problem because you have you know you kind of have a lot of things happening in the lab in Python. Then they build the model, but then it turns out that the without a lot of extra pre-processing. So, for example, TensorFlow. Uh, in order to actually deploy a TensorFlow model, there's a lot of pre, there's actually a lot of pre-processing you have to do. Most people don't know that, so you actually need to massage what what we call massaging the graph, so to speak. The graph is kind of the the, the instruction set. So it's the the like you need to add, then subtract, and multiply. That's a graph essentially. It's a, just a list of operations that you need to run in order to perform some target operation in AI, as we call it. So, so in, in this case, uh, it turns out uh, when you call tf.save or keras.save, there's actually a lot of stuff in there, and actually it won't run. So just because you can save a model doesn't mean it'll run properly. So there, like I said, there's a lot of noise. And then depending on if you want to run it on a different chip or not, you might need to quantize the model. You might need to post-process it in some form. Uh, so that post-processing work is a black art to most to most people who build the models. That stuff is a black art, and it's not clear it's not clear what will work in what scenario. So sometimes you might have one model you build for one scenario, and then a di completely different model that serves the same use case. But but maybe in, but what you're doing is you might make accuracy and you might make accuracy trade-offs, and, and just so it can run. Most again, most people don't know that. So that that integration problem and actually making AI models run. Especially at the accelerator level, it's not a well it's not a well solved problem yet. Most people just so any anytime you see an a, a quote unquote AI vendor, uh, what they do is they just use other people's software and then wrap it in Kubernetes. That's what most people do, and they, they say they did their own thing. Actually, they just bundled a bunch of stuff, and they they don't know how the underlying silicon works. And that's actually a big problem. If we're going to deploy AI models at the edge and have and, and, and actually kind of go after this ubiquitous computing problem, uh, you need to know how this stuff works. You can't hand wave it. Uh, so you need to work with the community. You need to work with a lot of these, a lot of these efforts, and that's that's essentially what we're trying to do. We're just trying to solve the integration problem. This is the only thing I do. Uh, so if you if you have any questions about that, uh, please do let me know. And I'll I'll end with metrics. So uh, you know these these are Linux Foundation projects. Some of these are Linux Foundation projects or widely used open source uh, you know kind of visualization based tools. You know so one 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 thing I want to say is. Uh, you want to, you know, depending on whether you're implementing uh, different kinds of, you know, ac a model accuracy dashboard, a model bias dashboard. Whenever you do that, you typically want to use open standards. So it turns out Prometheus and, and, and the a lot of the things in the Linux ecosystem are actually very good for this. And so, you know, we, we typically think of these for DevOps. But what if you have the same kind of DevOps style dashboard for model, so for, for for modeling accuracy and bias? And then what if your data scientist could then use that output? Basically, and say, okay, you know, this is the real world version. This is how well we're doing. Uh, otherwise, you know, otherwise, you know, we're otherwise they would never know, right? Because one thing that data, you know, because because data scientists, like one thing out there is they want to build the latest model, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in the real world. Uh, there's and you know, machine learning models they also have technical debt. The world changes. What do you do when that happens? Uh, you know, so if a, you know, a small example of that would be fraud detection. You know, so fraud, be, fraud, fraud detection changes every day. Uh, so what do you do about that? You might build machine learning models to detect this kind of fraud, but you almost always need to retrain the models because, again, the world changes. So this is called uh, this is this is this is called one 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 way to describe this is something called concept drift. So you have the real the real world is one concept, and then what your model thinks is the real world is another. When those two things differ, how do you know? You visualize it. And uh, with that, I'll end, and, and I'll take questions. Thank you.